everyone and welcome back for another tutorial video on Welch Bartlett uh, power spectral density estimation. In this video we're going to consider um, estimating the power spectral density um, for a second order system driven by white noise. So let's first see the system parameters. So this um, second order system, uh, second order discrete time linear time invariant system uh, defined by the system function g of z is driven by um, white noise. The input to the filter is zero mean Gaussian noise with the correlation sigma q squared delta of L, meaning that it's uncorrelated from sample to sample. So we run that through this LTI filter and then we get the output x of n. Now the filter has the system function g of z 1 over 1 minus r e to the j theta z inverse, 1 minus r e to the minus j theta z inverse. Um, so that's a two-pole system. And so right now, let's do a quick in-class problem. So stop here and sketch the pole zero plot for this filter, and then sketch its corresponding frequency response magnitude. And then unpause the video after you've done that. Okay, hopefully you did the problem for yourself and you found that um, the system has two poles and the poles are located at plus and minus theta um, in angle um, and the radius of the pole is at r. Um, so if r is equal to 0.85 and theta is equal to pi over 10, this is the pole zero plot that you get. And we know that we can do simple sketches of the frequency response from the pole zero plot. Um, we know that poles tend to push the frequency response up, so we expect to see peaks around plus and minus pi over 10, which we do. Here's the frequency response generated by MATLAB, um, and we see that there are peaks around plus and minus pi over 10. The height of those peaks is about 12, um, and then it falls off um, pretty rapidly outside of that. Okay, so that's for the case one that we'll consider. We'll consider one more case, case two, where all we do is move those poles closer to the unit circle. When we do that, that, that creates much larger peaks in the frequency response of the filter. So these peaks now go up to about 160, and they're very, very narrow because these poles are very close to the unit circle. So these are the two cases that we're going to consider for our power spectral density estimation problem. So first we have to look at what is the analytical power spectral density of x of n. So if we drive this LTI system g of z um, by q of n, which is just a white sequence, what do we get for the power spectral density of the output? Well, we can easily ca calculate that in terms of um, the input power spectral density and the frequency response of the filter. So the answer is that Sx of e to the j omega, the output power spectral density, is equal to the power spectral density of the input times the magnitude squared of the filter frequency response. The power spectral density of the input is just a constant because the Fourier transform of Rq of L is just sigma q squared. So the power spectral density at the output of the filter is just a scaled version of the square of the filter frequency response. So you can see that we can create a lot of different um, data sets um, just by driving um, different LTI filters with white noise. So we're just going to consider driving um, this particular LTI filter um, with uh, white noise um, for the rest of this set of slides. So we can simulate that data using MATLAB, and here's a simple uh, function to do that. Um, this function takes as input r, the radius of the, the poles, and theta, the angle of the poles, and sigma q squared. Um, and we also tell it how many data samples we want and the type of noise, whether it be real or complex. So are we driving this system with real um, zero mean Gaussian um, random variables or complex um, zero mean Gaussian random variables? And k points is just... Um, telling you how many points of the frequency response to calculate. So first, um, this simulation code generates the analytical spectrum. We can just do that by finding the vector of filter coefficients, the A vector, um, the A's, which would be in the, in the difference equation simulation of the filter. Um, and from that, we can use MATLAB's freak Z command um, to find the 
uh, frequency response. Um, the B vector for this particular filter is just one because there's a one in the numerator of, of our G of Z. So now the analytic spectrum, the analytic power spectral density should just be absolute value of G squared times the variance of the input noise. So we can generate our simulation data just by first generating the vector Q containing the samples of the discrete white noise, either complex or real. Um, and then we just run it through that filter. So use the filter command, which takes the B and the A coefficients um, for the filter and the input sequence Q. So this is the data, this is the function that we use to simulate the data for all the examples in the rest of these um, slides. So now we know from previous videos that the parameters of the window and the length of the data basically determine the performance of the power spectral density estimator. Um, the frequency resolution is determined by the main lobe width of the bandpass filter if we use our filter bank interpretation. And this is explicitly a function of window length and window type. It's primarily the length of the window, but the type of the window has a small effect on, um, on that main lobe width. The side lobe leakage is determined by the side lobe levels of the bandpass filter, and this is a function of window type. So if you change the type of window, you can change the side lobe levels. The variance is determined by the number of blocks that we have available for averaging. There is this inherent trade-off when we have just a fixed amount of data. We can use longer windows, which are going to give us better frequency resolution, but they will leave fewer blocks for averaging which will result in higher variance. Conversely, we can use shorter windows, which will yield worse frequency resolution, but it'll give us a lot more blocks to average over, resulting in a lowered variance. So we have this trade-off that we have to, to live with when we're doing the Welch-Bartlett approach. We know uh, for a set of standard window types, um, we know their characteristics very well. This is just the, the common table that you'd find in, in discrete time signal processing books like Oppenheim and Schaefer. Um, it gives you the side lobe of the window and the approximate width of the main lobe in terms of the length of the window. Here the length is in terms of m plus 1. So these results are given for rectangular, uh, Bartlett, Hanning, Hamming, and Blackman. So the two that we're going to use in these examples are the rectangular, which has a main lobe width of 4 pi over the length, and the Hanning, which has a main lobe width of 8 pi over the length, approximately, and a side lobe level of minus 31 dB. So let's look at case 1. This is the underlying frequency response um, for case 1, and so we would square that and multiply by sigma q squared to get our expected power spectral density. And what we're going to see here is that we've got these peaks at around plus and minus pi over 10. So we have to resolve peaks that are basically 2 pi over 10 radians per second apart. Um, for all the examples in this set of slides, we're going to assume sigma q squared is 3. The other thing is we've got this amount, you know, about 10 dB here of um, dynamic range if we take the log spectrum. Um, so we're going to need side lobes that are significantly lower than that to make sure that this part of the spectrum won't leak into our estimates for the higher frequency part of the spectrum. So we can first try a 40-point rectangular window. For a 40-point window, um, the main lobe width will be approximately 4 pi over 40, um, which is pi over 10. So we should be able to resolve things that are 2 pi over 10 apart. So if we try that 40-point window, here's the result we get. So this is just calculating the spectrum based on a single block of 40 points of data with a rectangular window. Um, this is the spectrum, the estimated spectrum on a linear scale, and this is on a log scale. We're going to find log scale will be helpful for interpreting parts of the spectrum. But what's shown, going to be shown in all of these plots is the red curve is the analytic result. So that's the predicted spectrum that we know should be true um, based because we know exactly how the data is being generated. And the blue is the Welch-Bartlett estimate. So what we see here is we've got um, some behavior that looks similar to what we would expect, but it's pretty high variance. And we can look at another realization. So this is a different realization. 
And that's what we get. Comparing these two, you can get an idea of the variance of those spectral estimates. And indeed, this is with one block, this is essentially the periodogram. And the variance of the periodogram is about equal to the um, squared value of the power spectral density we're estimating. So that's pretty high variance. The variance is on the order of the thing that we are estimating, or the square of the, the quantity that we're estimating, rather. So we can do what Welch and Bartlett suggest and try averaging to reduce the variance. So the variance of Welch-Bartlett with L segments will be, um, oh, and I have an error here in my slides, um, the variance is approximately equal to Sx squared e to the j omega over L. Um, and so if we average over 10 blocks, this is the result in the linear case and the log uh, of that. And if we average over 100 blocks, we get an even smoother result with lower variance. Now the thing you notice here, though, is that we, we have this bias in the spectrum at higher frequencies, and that's due to the high side lobes of the rectangular window. So we can get rid of that and um, try a different window. So um, if we use an 80-point Hanning window, Hanning window, remember, has side lobes that are about 20 dB lower than the rectangular window. If we use the 80-point Hanning window, um, we need to make the Hanning window wider because its main lobe width is wider. So we, we double the length of the window. And now we look at the 100-point average for that Hanning window. And now that bias that was evident before at high frequencies has gone away. So using a window with lower side lobes substantially reduces the leakage and produces a better estimate of the spectrum, particularly for the low parts of the spectrum, because now the, the high energy parts of the spectrum aren't corrupting the low energy parts of the spectrum. We can take a look at another um, parameter selection for case two. Um, so we look at case two. Remember case two has uh, much narrower peaks, and so we're going to need better frequency resolution. So better frequency resolution means basically we have to choose a longer window, because a longer window will result in a narrower main lobe. So we'll try a 400 point Hanning window, which has a main lobe width of about pi over 100. So hopefully that should be enough to resolve these very narrow peaks. We'll use the Hanning because we know we need um, the side lobe rejection that it provides. So here's the results um, for a, a single block of data for that 400 point Hanning window. Um, we can see that um, we have a pretty uh, high variance in the spectrum with just a single block, but we know how to reduce that variance um, if we average over more blocks. So averaging over 100 blocks for this Hanning window gets us a very nice, smooth result um, that pretty much lines up with the analytic prediction. So before finishing up here, I just want to make one note about the variance of the spectrum. We can actually estimate the variance of the spectrum by estimating, uh, computing a large set of sample spectra for a specific case, and then computing the variance over those samples. So I just basically run the code multiple times, like a thousand times, and um, generate the spectra for each of those times, and then just use the sample variance, which you can implement using VAR in MATLAB, um, to compute the sample variance of the estimated spectrum. So if we do that for case one, um, so case one, um, I'm now just considering data where we have a 10 block average, um, and we're estimating it using our 400 point Hanning window, and this is the, for the real data case that I've showed you before. Um, so the prediction, if we're using a 10 block average, the prediction is that the predicted variance should be Sx squared over 10, because we've um, cut the variance by a factor of 10. And that's what's shown in the red curve. That's the prediction. And what's shown in the blue is the sample variance. If I do my processing a thousand times for a thousand different um, data sets, and it lines up very well with the exception of um, right at omega equals zero. Um, and um, if we do that for complex data, we won't get that, that little perturbation at omega equals zero. And what it, this is a known issue. It turns out that um, the, the variance 
at zero and at pi for um, the real data case is going to, the prediction should have other terms in it, whereas for the complex data case, this is the accurate uh, prediction just by itself is sx squared. So you can see Kay's book or other references in Therian for a brief discussion of, of that. I just wanted to highlight it in case you were trying it with real data and, and trying to calculate the estimated variance and, and observe that effect. Okay, so that finishes our, um, our second order system example. And we can just go back here and summarize um, hopefully what we've learned that um, the parameters of the window that we use for our window transform in Welch Bartlett um, and the length of the data effectively determine the performance of the Welch Bartlett estimator. Um, the window length and type determine the frequency resolution and the leakage, and the variance is determined by the number of blocks we have available for averaging. So I will provide um, the, the data um, or the, the MATLAB code on the website um, so that you can experiment with um, some more examples of this type. So that's all, and thanks for listening.